Good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you so much for joining us here at the GCA Church Online. Uh, today is the day that we were supposed to be heading out as a school and as a church family to Cahutta, where we had reserved the Lakeside Amphitheater to do our outdoor Sabbath. Well, we are not meeting at Cahutta today for outdoor Sabbath and we are not together, but we decided that we would still record an outdoor Sabbath for you for the GCA Church today. Um, I know that there are some of you who are maybe unsupportive and you're just no fun. There are some of you in the church that are excited that we're not worshiping outside, but that you're sitting inside on your comfortable chair. Either way, we're glad you're here with us uh, today. Today we have several announcements for you. First of all, I just want to remind the elders that there will be an elders meeting on Monday at 7.15 on Zoom. We'll be sending out that link to you so that you can join that elders meeting. And also I wanted to give you an update on David Smith, our new senior pastor. So Pastor David and his family have been packing. They're moving down to, to Georgia uh, very shortly. And their first Sabbath at the GCA Church will be on May 23. Now, we've all kind of been worrying that uh, his first Sabbath would be preaching to a camera, but I'm hopeful, I can't speak for the board yet, the board will ultimately make that decision, but I'm hopeful that we can meet in person at the GCA Church on May 23. Um, the conference has asked us to stay closed up until May 17, uh, so that would mean that we could possibly meet on May 23 together uh, at the GCA Church. So continue to pray that this uh, whole situation improves and that we'll be able to meet together and worship together soon and hopefully meet our new pastor we won't be shaking hands probably but we'll be waving at him and and you know it'll be very nice and awkward so anyway yes we're looking forward to david smith being here also wanted to invite you to the campus of georgia cumberland academy today at three o'clock from three to five uh, there will be a special event happening of sorts. Um, the, some of the GCA staff have gotten together and we've decided to do uh, chalk art on the ground, on the road around Faculty Circle. And so if you're interested in reading some positive uh, verses that are written on the, on the sidewalk or the, or the road, or if you're interested in uh, seeing the works of art of some of the GCA staff, then I encourage you to join us here on campus. It's a beautiful day today. And join us here on campus from 3 to 5 o'clock this afternoon. We hope to see you there. Thank you again for being here with us, and we hope that you enjoy the special outdoor Sabbath. Thank you. Good morning, boys and girls, and happy Sabbath. My name is Kelly Herr. And you might recognize these two kiddos, Isaac and Avery, and I'm now part of their family. And I'm gonna be sticking around Calhoun for quite a while now. This morning for Children's Story, we're gonna to talk to you about prayer and more specifically, how excited Jesus gets when you pray to him. And here's the good news. Jesus hears all prayers, not just prayers from our parents or from our pastors, or from our teachers, but prayers from kids too. It's important that we talk to Jesus throughout the day, tell him our blessings and things that are on our heart. There are a couple Bible verses I wanna share with you this morning. The first one is found in Psalm 145, verse 18. It says, the Lord is near to all who call on him. And then in 1 John 5, 14, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When we talk to God, he hears us. Jesus wants to be a part of your life. And when we pray to him, we get closer to him. This morning, Isaac and Avery are going to help me show a little bit about how excited Jesus gets when we pray to him. Isaac and Avery, will you put a tablet in your water, please? Just as our water is starting to bubble up, Jesus bubbles up with excitement when we pray to him. So I'm going to ask all you boys and girls at home and Isaac and Avery to think about something that's on your heart. Maybe you're worried because your mom or dad is a nurse or a doctor at the hospital and you wanna pray that they stay safe during this coronavirus. Maybe you have an upcoming math test you're a little worried about. 
maybe an animal or a pet is sick, will you please bow your heads and have a silent prayer asking Jesus to be with the concern that's on your heart? Let's bow our heads. Amen. All right, Isaac and Avery, will you put another tablet in your water, please? Excellent. Even with our concerns, Jesus gets excited because we're coming to him with our worries and our fears. Now I want you to think of a blessing that happened this week. Maybe you got to go on a hike with your family. Maybe you did really well in your spelling test. Maybe you um, taught your dog a trick. I want you now to thank God for something great that happened this week. Will you please bow your heads, boys and girls at home, and Isaac and Avery. Amen. All right, put another tablet in. It might overflow, but that's okay, because Jesus overflows with excitement when we pray to him, even with the good things. Oh, Isaac, look at it happen. <laughs> It's fun to go to the movies. It's fun to play basketball with our friends. It's fun to play with our fingerlings. Shouldn't it be fun to pray to Jesus also? Spend time with him every single day. And after you pray, listen to what he has to say. Isaac and Avery, I know the boys and girls can't hear it at home, but what do you hear when you put these tablets in the water? It's kind of like bubbly. It's bubbly? What do you think, Isaac? I don't really hear anything. I just watch it like bubble up real quick. Bubble up really quick. Well, when we are quiet and we listen after we pray, we can see miracles happen right in front of our eyes. I would like Isaac, would you have closing prayer for us and we spend a little more, more time with Jesus yeah. to make him excited? Yes. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that we get to come here today and please help coronavirus to be over soon. Amen. Amen. Should we put one more in and just watch it overflow really big? Oh, man. You put too much food <laughs> All right. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls, and spend time with Jesus this week in prayer.
Transitions are a part of life. Now some transitions we look forward to with much anticipation, while others sometimes we dread. Maybe starting a new job, or beginning the next year of school, becoming a new parent, or sending your kids off to college. These are just some of the many transitions that we experience as the years roll by. And over the next few weeks, we will be looking at this topic of transitions and looking at a variety of different Bible stories and seeing what God's Word has to share with us on this topic and idea. So today though, we're going to be talking about the importance of connection through times of transition. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here together this morning and to worship. Even though we are separated, Lord, um, you are connecting us through our homes and through the use of technology, and we are so grateful. Just ask that you would please speak through me this morning and that your words would come through loud and clear and that we would learn more about who we are and your character as we study and we dive into your word this morning. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. So for my students who think I am in my 30s, thank you very much. But this next story might date me just a little bit. Um, so if you want to really do the research and figure out when Hotmail started, that might help you to deduct my age. You see, Randy and I started dating um, the summer after I finished my freshman year of college and he finished his sophomore year. We met at Mount Etna Summer Camp in Hagerstown, Maryland. And I can guarantee you that it was not love at first sight for both of us. We will both readily admit to that. Um, in fact, a friend told Randy that he should consider dating me and he politely declined. But after one late night conversation after campfire, it set the wheels into motion for a whirlwind romance. And by the end of the summer, we were already talking about getting married. Don't worry, not that summer. We were planning longer in the future, but we were already talking about that like, yeah, you are the one and I wanna spend my life with you. So when camp ended, Randy headed back down to Southern to work for a few weeks before the next school year started. So we were gonna be apart for about a month. And this was before the day and age of cell phones. I did not have a cell phone. Um, they were just coming out, but they were very expensive. And to, trust me, they did not have the features that they do nowadays. So in order for us to stay in touch with one another, we had to, um, had to do it through email and through a landline phone, which I had to pay long distance on based on per minute that we talked. So I know that this sounds maybe really corny, but oftentimes we would send each other emails back and forth that we would share how our day went or what was going on. So my, my newly formed um, Hotmail account that I'd only had for a year definitely got its use in that month that we were apart. But I have to tell you, we were both looking forward so much to being back together in person. Because this whole email thing was just not as much fun as being together. And it's kind of like what I feel like right now, that I cannot wait to be reunited together as a church family and worship together in person. You see, in-person communication is way better than phone calls or emails. When you're sitting across from somebody, you can read their body language and tell what they're thinking and feeling through how they're acting. You can feel the energy when they laugh or when they get excited about something. Or you can put your arm around them or give them a hug when you know that they are sad. So don't get me wrong, I am very grateful and thankful for Zoom and FaceTime and all the technology that we have that we are able to now stay in touch and that I've been able to still communicate with friends and with my students um, 
during this time that we are isolated from one another, but it never, never will take the place of in-person connection because we are wired for connection. It's built into our DNA because honestly, we are made in the image of God and we serve a God who is a relational being. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have enjoyed a perfect bond since the beginning of time. I mean, they are the very epitome of a loving relationship. They put each other's interests above their own. They enjoy each other's company. In fact, they delight in each other's presence. I'm sure that they laugh together and they play together um, and they collaborate and do things together instead of separated. From the creation of the world to the plan of salvation, they are united in their love for each other and for us. This may be a new picture of God for you because many people view him as stoic or distant and unrelatable. But John 1.18 gives us a glimpse into the loving union within the Godhead. It says this, No one has ever seen God, but the unique one, this is talking about Jesus, the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart he has revealed God to us. And I want to look at this one phrase that Jesus is near to the Father's heart because this gives us an idea of their deep intimacy together. Now the new, the Phillips New Testament Bible translation, it states it this way. Um, Jesus, who lives in the closest intimacy with the Father. And the New American Standard Bible translates this as Jesus is in the bosom of the Father. So all of these phrases, they indicate that father and son share this intimate connection. I mean, trust me, you do not snuggle up to the bosom of somebody that you don't care about and that you're not close with. This is just one of countless scriptures that demonstrate the loving other-centered relationship the Godhead shares with one another. Now enter the creation of human beings. I mean, when God formed Adam, he recognized that Adam was going to need some connection. And first of all, though, when God formed him, he, he formed him from the dust. God got down on his hands and knees, and he took time and effort to form Adam. Whereas all the other things that God created, he spoke a word, and they came into existence. But here he is, lovingly down there, forming Adam, and then he gets face to face with Adam mouth to mouth, and he breathes his life into Adam. Now, the only time that two people get face to face together is if they kiss each other or if they're giving CPR. And maybe we could say that God was ultimately doing both. But here he is. It just paints this picture for this closeness between creator and his creation. And then, yes, after he, he wakes Adam up and Adam's there and God makes this statement, and whether he says it out loud in Adam's presence or whether he was kind of talking out loud to himself, this is what God says. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So then God does something interesting though. He now takes Adam who now God has created the animals and he's created man. Here is the creator and the master artist. And he now gives this job to Adam. He like turns over this task of naming all of the animals. This only happens in an other-centered loving relationship where ego is non-existent. So God and Adam now spend the afternoon together with Adam naming the creatures. And I wonder if Adam was like looking around going like, well, wait, where is there one that looks like me? But no, there was, there was two zebras and two giraffes and, and two cats and two dogs. But there wasn't another human being that looked like him that would be a companion for Adam. So I'm sure he was recognizing all of this. And then, then God does something. He knocks Adam out with holy anesthesia. And he performs the first surgery in history. Where God takes a rib from Adam's side. And now God just takes as much time as he did forming Adam. And he forms Eve from the dust. And he places Adam's rib inside of her. And then God breathes life into Eve as well. And when, he, and when she wakes up, he presents 
Eve to Adam and performs the first marriage ceremony and then celebrates the Sabbath together. Talk about love, talk about connection. So you see, connection with others and with God, it's built into the fabric of who we are as human beings. And yet, ironically, loneliness is on the rise. And I can only imagine that it has skyrocketed during this pandemic that we are currently facing. A study published two years ago by Cigna, which is a global health service company, found that 46% of U.S. adults reported sometimes or always feeling lonely, and 47% um, reported feeling left out. Almost half of the adult population in America feels disconnected. Surprisingly, the reason the research found that loneliness affected younger adults more than the elderly by 10%. And the chief medical officer for behavioral health at Cigna was quoted as saying that it didn't matter how many friends someone had on social media, it was the in-person relationships that made the difference and kept people from feeling lonely. We are at a point of transition as human beings. We are living in a day and age where people are craving connection. And yet we are becoming more and more a polarized nation. And I would even venture to say a church. Sociologists are finding that we are surrounding ourselves with like-minded people and distancing ourselves from anyone who disagrees with us. And maybe you might think that that means that we're more connected with, with people and yet it's putting these barriers between all kinds of groups of people. Instead of finding ways that we can agree or choosing to listen to somebody's point of view, even if at the end of the discussion we choose to agree to disagree, we are viewing people as enemies. And the differing of opinions that we often vent through quick typing fingers or through arguments verbal arguments, they are erecting walls between us and they're serving to isolate us even further. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, now we have this virus that is spreading across the world, which is causing us to have to physically isolate ourselves from one another. In this pandemic, it has placed a new wedge between us as human beings. Fear and hatred are running rampant right now. Fear is causing us to look at everyone as a potential carrier who might infect us. So we keep our distance from one another and we don't interact with other people. We stay separated because even though we want human connection, we're so scared. So we push everybody away and hatred is causing us to point fingers at anybody and everybody we can, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats or these physicians in their opinion or somebody else. It just depends on where we stand. And, and so we point fingers and we distance ourselves further. And if that wasn't bad enough, hate crimes are on the rise against Asian Americans. And, and we're lumping millennials all into this group of that they don't care, even though it was only a small portion of their peers who spent their spring break in Florida. But we're lumping everybody together and we're labeling them because they are different or they don't operate in the same way that we're comfortable with. You see, Satan doesn't care how he takes us down. He simply wants to defeat us. And he knows that honestly, we are weak on our own. If he can separate us from God and from each other, our support system, whether it's our church or our friends or our family, then he has the upper hand. If we lose our connection with God and others, then we are susceptible to getting swept away in the tide. Think about it this way. I read a quote once that said, a great defense is the best offense. A great defense is the best offense. In any sport, a solid defensive line that can hold back the, the approaching team and the offense and keep them from scoring is going to give their team the better shot at scoring and winning games. But a great defense, I mean, that takes time and it takes communication. It takes effort and intentionality and it takes time to be connected as a unit and moving in one direction together. 
Although there wasn't football or soccer or basketball when Jesus walked this earth, he understood this concept and he shared a story, an analogy that his listeners would have resonated with. In John 10, we have the story of the Good Shepherd. In verse 14 says this, I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me, just as my Father knows me and I know the Father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Now, although none of us are sheep farmers, I'm sure that we have all watched Planet Earth or some other nature documentary that showcases a predator that's stalking its prey. And we know how this works, right? The predator like seeks out a herd and, and they work together to separate part of the herd so that they can then attack and kill that one animal that they pulled apart. And in this instance, as Jesus is talking about the sheep, if a wolf came and approached a herd of sheep and the shepherd was there, the shepherd would defend and, and fight off the wolves. Or if the sheep were to cluster together and to, to stay in a, in a group, they would be able to maybe feed off, fend off the attack of the wolf by staying together and it would not be as easy for the wolf to get its prize. Jesus uses the language of connection when he says that he knows his sheep, which is us, and that the Father knows him. Just as he and the Father are connected, Jesus is saying that he wants to be connected with us. And then he goes on to remind us in this passage that, that his flock is a big flock and that it's not this one group over here or that group, that he, he intends to bring everyone into the sheepfold together. And instead of being separated in these different groups that, and especially as he was talking back then, that he was, giving a hint to the Jews that it wasn't just about them, that he loves everyone and that he had plans to bring in the Gentiles and, and to form a group of people who loved him. So it's this idea that Jesus is presenting that, that we are to join together and to be united together. Now, if we had to boil Jesus' teachings down to one theme, I mean, we would land on the topic of love which is extremely logical because God is love and Jesus came to show us God's character. If you think about it, you can't have love without connection. It's a natural response to love. The two go hand in hand. And this is why Jesus' final prayer that is recorded in John 17 is full of the language of love and connection. He knew that the only way his disciples and the early church would survive is if they stayed connected to God and if they loved God and that they stayed connected to one another. Jesus begins his prayer by praying for himself, that God would be glorified in what was about to transpire. But not just for Jesus' own benefit, but that through his death on the cross that he would be glorifying God. And then Jesus turns his focus to his disciples and he prays for them. He prays for protection for them against the enemy and for unity and love amongst, their midst, amongst them. And then he turns his attention to us and he prays for us down through all these ages. 2,000 years later, Jesus was praying for us when he said these words in verse 20. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Jesus prayed for us that we would stay united in our shared mission to love others with abandon as he did. This concept is so important that Jesus reiterates it in verse 23. He says this, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. 
Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. God is love. So his church needs to be based on love. This is evident in Jesus' prayer. He knew that the only way that the church would work is if it acted out the love that would then be like the glue holding us all together. After Jesus prayed these powerful words, he was arrested, unfairly tried, and sentenced to death. The events that unfolded in the span of 24 hours, they shook the disciples and Jesus' followers to the very core, and many of them ran away in fear for their own lives, now that their master was being tried and was being sentenced, put to death. And in their moment of panic, they forgot the key to what would see them through to the other side. Fortunately, the story doesn't stop there. Jesus' resurrection, it gave them a renewed energy, and his commission gave them purpose and a mission to focus on, to share the good news of God's love with everyone they came in contact with. But once again, Jesus in his infinite wisdom, he knew that they would need to be connected with one another. So he told them right before his ascension, he told them to go to Jerusalem and to spend time together and to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit before they embarked on this mission of sharing the gospel with everyone. So that's exactly what they did. In Acts 1.14, we find that they all met together. This is what the Bible says. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. Then we find that 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion, we now land on the day of Pentecost. And the disciples, they were all gathered together in the upper room and they were praying together when a whirlwind swept through the room and then flames landed and settled above each of their heads as the Holy Spirit was poured out on their group. And, and this noise, apparently this wind, it was so loud that a large crowd gathered in the streets below because they'd heard something happen. And the disciples came out, the apostles came out, and Peter preaches his first sermon to the group of people from all different nationalities, and they all hear in their own language, Peter sharing about God and about Jesus and his death and his resurrection and the hope of salvation. And after this, we find that 3,000 people were baptized. 3,000 people gave their hearts to Christ that day. It had to have been electrifying. It had to have been electrifying for the Holy Spirit to pour out on them, but it had to be even more exhilarating to see that many people commit their lives to Jesus. And then we find in Acts 2, 42 through 47, we get this brief glimpse into the early church after this event happens. So we go from about 120 believers. We find that in Acts 1, that there was about 120 that were gathering together regularly. So we go from having just 100 people to now in the thousands who have joined together to form the early church. And this is what it says about the believers and what they were doing together. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Isn't this a beautiful picture of what church can look like? They didn't know what the future held any more than we do dealing with this pandemic. I mean, the Romans were still oppressing the Jews and the religious leaders were still trying to hide the truth. They lived in tumultuous times where they, they worried about their safety and they didn't know what was going to happen. Which is why their bond 
was so much more vital and so much more important that through worship and through prayer and shared meals together and general fellowship with one another, that's what held them together to get through this time of transition where they didn't know what the future held. Their support of one another strengthened them for the road to come. Right now, we are honestly being hit below the belt with this pandemic, attacking the core of who we are and who God made us to be as relational beings, which is why we have to fight back. We have to be intentional about connecting with one another and supporting each other through this difficult time for however long it lasts. Whether it's through the use of technology or safely meeting in person, we have to pursue connection with one another. So I wanna challenge us. I wanna challenge each one of us that this next week that we reach out to at least five people, whether it's through a text or a call or maybe it's dropping off some flowers or goodies at someone's doorstep or mailing a card. Or maybe it's going on a walk together, obviously keeping six feet of separation between another friend and yourself, but you know, getting together and going for a walk or maybe planning a virtual gathering of multiple friends together so you can laugh and share stories with one another. But whatever you do, I just encourage you this next week to reach out to at least five people. I know that we can make it through this together and through this time of transition in our world as long as we keep our faith in Jesus and our connection with each other. Now I want to close today with a story about a difficult time that we went through and a difficult transition in our life when Ryan was born. Now I know I've mentioned before that Ryan had to have a surgery within 24 hours of being born and then he had two other follow-up ones, one at six months and nine months. Um, so three hospital stays, two of which were in the NICU and the PICU, that cost a small fortune. Not to mention the emotional expenditure that we faced each time we prepared for another surgery. But you know what I remember about that whole time and that whole experience? I remember my friends and my church family who supported us beyond anything we honestly could have imagined. I remember the Sabbath, not uh, shortly after our first surgery when we, when we came home, that we were standing in church and we just finished singing the opening hymn and a friend of ours who was sitting right behind us literally slipped us a check for $500. We didn't ask, we didn't share any financial needs, he simply gave. And I'll never forget the meals that friends brought over for the first few weeks when we came home so that we didn't have to cook. Or, or the visits in the hospital, or the prayers that were, were given on our behalf, or honestly the hugs and the shared tears when it was just emotionally challenging and stressful. All of those times together, all of that love and connection, that's what I remember. Because that's what bound us together and helped us through this difficult time that we were facing in our lives. We are made in the image of a relational God who embodies love and connection. And as Jesus prayed, I just pray also that we would be united together and that we would share our love for one another and that as a church that we would be intentional about our relationships with one another because that's what's going to see us through this and whatever transitions the future might hold. We are not made to do life by ourselves. We are made to do it with our Heavenly Father and with each other. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we love you so much and we are so grateful for your example and for the love that you show us each and every day. Lord, I just pray that, that as this world and as the events that unfold around us seek to separate us, that we would, not, we would push back and we would not let that happen that we would keep our connection with one another and with you, and that we would get through this together because that's how you made us to be. We love you so much. We're so thankful for all of your many blessings that you pour out on us each and every day. And Lord, we just ask that we would be able to worship together soon and that you would reunite us and our GCA family and our students in the coming school year, and that you would see us through safely until that time when we can be back together. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen.